All right. Um, now, hopefully, most of you guys are sort of familiar with metabolism from other biology classes. We don't really have time to do an in-depth study on like glycolysis and the citric acid cycle and the electron transport chain and aerobic respiration, how all of that stuff works. Hopefully you guys are sort of familiar with that already. Uh, however, you know, I do expect that you know that stuff. So if you're a little bit shaky on it, you've either, you know, you've never had biochemistry, which I assume, how many people here have had biochemistry? Few, few of you have. I assume most of you haven't. Um, and if it's been a long time since Gen Chem, um, <clears throat> I've put a bunch of uh, links to Khan Academy videos that do a really good job of going over all of the chemical reactions in aerobic respiration uh, in the syllabus. So if you're at all shaky on that sort of stuff, you should probably go review them because I, I do expect that you have that knowledge somewhere in your head. But that stuff is pretty universal to life in general. Um, it's not strictly or even primarily uh, microbial. So today I'm going to be focusing on some of the more uh, microbially associated catabolic pathways, starting off with fermentation. Now, fermentation is something that lots of organisms do. In fact, you guys here do fermentation, but it is something that is uh, more frequently associated with microbes. Uh, fermentation is typically an anaerobic process, and there are actually very few anaerobic multicellular organisms. There are some, but not very many. Some fungi, which really sort of qualify as microbes. Uh, I can't, off the top of my head, think of any anaerobic animals or plants. Um, so most of the things that are going to live in anaerobic environments are going to be microbes uh, of one stripe or another. Now, fermentation is a very useful process for us as humans and for microorganisms that need to live in various places. Uh, we'll get into sort of what the technical definition of fermentation is in a little bit. But uh, in common usage, so if we're speaking like English, kind of technical English, but we're speaking English rather than chemistry, and there's slightly different languages, we usually think of fermentation as being um, like microbially produced uh, food products or industrial products. So up here, we see some of the uh, uh, some of the products of fermentation. We've got some beer. Here's a you know, very common microbial fermented product made by yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, or beer yeast. Uh, bread. Bread can be a product of well, bread is really a product of uh, both aerobic respiration, the sugars in the bread, and, uh, and, and the oxygen that you mix in when you're kneading the dough uh, causes the yeast to produce lots of carbon dioxide, and hence you get the leavening effect of the bread. But much bread actually derives, like, you get its, its shape and its lightness and its, like, the leavenedness of it from the aerobic respiration, but often you get a lot of the specific taste of bread from fermentation products. This is especially true in sourdough bread. Pickles. Uh, pickling is, is interesting. It's both a preserving method uh, and a, especially in the case of like 
your, your uh, kosher dill type of pickles is also a fermentation process. There are some bacteria that add flavors to the cucumbers or to the whatever you happen to be pickling. Um, the, uh, the cider in the back there, I don't think that that's particularly a fermented product, but you can certainly ferment cider. I imagine most of us have seen it, if not had it. Um, very good stuff, hard cider. So it is fermentation. In the chemical sense, fermentation is an anaerobic process where cells turn chemical energy, like glucose or other sugars, into ATP. So they're going to extract energy from the glucose and store that energy in ATP using an endogenous, which means internal or part of the cell, electron acceptor. That endogenous electron acceptor is typically going to be an organic molecule. And in the types of fermentation we're talking about today, they're going to be the chemical product of the glucose breakdown. So that's a technical definition. Let's get a little bit more into the specifics of what it means. So anaerobic, that means that it doesn't require oxygen. Hopefully most of you are familiar with this. You think like aerobic exercise, right? You gotta always remember to breathe because the thing about aerobic exercise is that you are you are using all of the oxygen that you can get into your blood, which is why you can do aerobics for half an hour, but no one can sprint for half an hour. Um, so how is this different from respiration? Well, the big difference is going to be in the oxygen, which leads us to the question of what the oxygen does. We're going to tackle each of these questions here. So I've got here a little glucose molecule. Glucose is typically represented as a hexagon because it's kind of hexagon shaped. And you don't want to get into the specifics of drawing all of the chemical bonds because this isn't a biochemistry class. Um, and I've made this hexagon, this glucose molecule, kind of a bright yellow. I want you to think of that bright yellow color as representing the electronic energy stored in the bonds of glucose. So you've got to remember that chemical bonds represent electrons. They are shared electrons. So the more bonds something has, the more electronic energy is there to be stored. That's why big, long molecules like you know, the hydrocarbons that you use in your uh, car are much more energy rich than small, short molecules. Um, and in fact, uh, like there was a, a thing, I don't know if it's still big now, there was a, uh, about five, six years ago, there was a big push towards uh, E85 or 85% ethanol gasoline. And it's kind of cool because like ethanol is a completely renewable resource, as we'll talk about later today. Um, one of the problems with it, one of the reasons why it hasn't taken off quite as much is that like... Ethanol is actually a really tiny molecule, as opposed to the octane that's used in your gasoline engines is much longer. So the energy density of ethanol is much smaller. You have a lot less energy that you can extract from it, which means that you get fewer miles per the gallon. So that gallon comes from a renewable resource as opposed to you know, something that you're pumping out of the ground, but still you're going to get fewer miles for every gallon of, you know, stop that you put in your car uh, because it has fewer electron bonds. And we talked about last week different energy storage molecules. The energy storage molecule for electronic energy or electrical energy is NAD plus or NADH depending upon whether it's energy poor or energy rich. So during respiration, you're going to extract 
the electrical energy from glucose and store it on NADH. And basically, every NADH stores two electrons. If you're doing full aerobic cellular respiration, you're going to break each of those six bonds in the glucose. And you're going to reduce it all the way down to inorganic carbon dioxide. But each of those six carbon molecules in that glucose will become a carbon dioxide, which is released into the atmosphere. So aerobic respiration uh, takes this reduced electron energy uh, on NADH, and it doesn't just keep it as NADH. NADH, you don't actually have a whole ton of it in your body. And if you didn't take that electrical energy and do something with it, you would fill up full of NADH very, very quickly. And uh, you would no longer be able to get new energy because all of your NADH is, is used. It's all in storage. It's like you got, um, you know, you've got like a little tiny bin for storage. And once it's full, you've got to take something out before you put another thing in. So in aerobic respiration, now we're not talking about fermentation yet. We're going to take that energy out of NADH uh, and... There's a big, long process that goes on through the electron transport chain where it's actually going to bounce back and forth across a membrane, transporting protons as it goes. And the protons act like, you know, all of the, uh, like, water. You're going to get all the protons on one side, then they're going to flow back to their original side. When they do that, they're going to run a pump. The point of all this is that the electrons have got to end up somewhere. They can't end up back on the NADH because your NADH would get full. You can't just have random electrons wandering around the cell because they kill the cell. They're extremely damaging. Not only that, you can only hand electrons downhill without spending energy. So something that's really high in energy, like NADH, can hand the electrons to something that's slightly lower in energy, is slightly lower, slightly lower. This is how the electron transport chain works. You keep handing it down, handing it down, handing it down. Um, everything that you hand it to has to want the electrons more than you do. That's why the electrons flow to it. And the most electron wanting molecule, or the most electronegative molecule, not in the world, but that's common and safe to use, is oxygen. Oxygen really loves electrons. And that's the whole point of oxygen. That's all that it does. We talk about oxygen as like it's going to increase your energy. Um, it does, but only by allowing this to happen. The way oxygen comes in is all it's doing is it's taking away those electrons so that the system can continue to run. If you don't take away the electrons, it gets backed up. And then, you know, you can't remove any more electrons from an ADH. Your ADH gets full, and then you can't get any more energy. And in fact, there are some really powerful poisons that that's how they work. It's by stopping that process from happening. Um, not arsenic, the other one. Cyanide does that. And it keeps one of the most potent poisons out there. So... When oxygen absorbs the electrons, it becomes water. And you'll note that I have the water in bright yellow because that's where the energy ends up. That is the final repository of the electron energy. The electrons hop onto the oxygen. The oxygen grabs a couple of hydrogens from, you know, there's just a bunch of hydrogens hanging around all the time. There's Tom Ellis in the galaxy. Uh, and boom, you get water. And that's where the electronic energy ends up. Now, on its way from NADH to water, it does a lot of work. And that work, like, spins this little molecule called uh, ATP synthase. 
it's really totally awesome molecule. It's exactly like a little nano machine where it's like actually spinning around in a circle. And as it spins around, what it's doing is it's taking ADP, phosphate, wham, slamming them together and making ATP. That's aerobic respiration in a very tiny nutshell. It gets a lot more complicated than that. I hope you guys will all go sort of look it up. But that's about the time that we have for aerobic respiration. I want to focus on how fermentation differs from aerobic respiration. First, I've got a question for you guys. Where does the electrical energy extracted, I should say from glucose, sorry, extracted from glucose end up in aerobic respiration? Does it end up on oxygen? No? NADH? Water? Yes? ATP? No? What about an organic molecule? Good. You're all paying attention. Yeah, ends up on the water. So oxygen is an electron sponge. That's the role it plays in the cell. And fermentation is an anaerobic process. You have no oxygen, which means that you've got electrons that you've got to get rid of. And that's the big question with fermentation is, what the heck do you do with all of these electrons? You don't have the oxygen to take them away at the end of the electron transport chain, so you can't send them through the electron transport chain. But those electrons have still got to go somewhere. So fermentation begins like respiration. The first step of both of them is called glycolysis. And uh, it's a, a, we're going to talk about glycolysis in depth in a bit. But basically... In glycolysis, what you're doing is removing a few electrons from glucose. You're not doing the whole thing. So you're not taking it all the way to carbon dioxide. You're just going to split a couple of bonds. You're going to make a little bit of NADH. And uh, you're also going to generate a little bit of ATP. This ATP is not generated by ATP synthase in the electron transport chain. Okay? There are two types of ways to make ATP. If you do with the, the cellular respiration route with oxygen, and you're bouncing electrons to the electron transport chain, and uh, it goes through ATP synthase like we just talked about, that's called oxidative phosphorylation. This is not oxidative phosphorylation. This is what's called substrate level phosphorylation. Basically, um, so there are a great many enzymes that use ATP to drive a chemical reaction forward. You guys are probably sort of familiar with this. And last week we talked about how all reactions catalyzed by enzymes go in both directions. So what's the opposite? You have one reaction that uses ATP to drive a chemical reaction forward. What happens if you drive that chemical reaction backwards? You make a little bit of ATP. Not a lot, a little bit. Glycolysis typically generates two net ATP for every glucose molecule that goes through. When you take this electrical energy away, you're breaking bonds. And glycolysis is, is literally glyco sugar lysis to cut the cutting of the sugar. And that's exactly what you're doing. You're cutting the sugar in half and you end up with two half-glucoses, and the term for a half-glucose is a pyruvate. So you get two pyruvates or two pyruvic acids, which is really the same thing. And you get a little bit of ATP. And you get the electrical energy. 
you've made some NADH. Now, NADH is useful, right? You can use NADH to make lots of energy in the electron transport chain. We don't have any oxygen. So you can't use the electron energy in the electron transport chain. Now, some of this energy can be used up doing other stuff in the cell. There's lots of stuff in the cell that requires NADH. So some of that's going to get funneled off to do useful things that the cell is doing. But over time, because you're, you're not getting a lot of ATP per glucose molecule, you're going to have to be churning through a lot of glucose molecules here. And over time, and it doesn't take a whole lot of time, your NADH supply is going to get full. You gotta do something with those electrons. So the electrical energy is in fermentation. The electrical energy is then deposited back on the pyruvate. So you stole the energy from glucose, you split it into two halves, you take each of those two halves. We're not going to recombine to make the glucose because then we'd have to put the ATP back in. We want to keep the ATP up. So we're just going to stuff the electrons back onto each half molecule here. So we're taking the electrons off. Boom. Smacking them back onto the pyruvate. This is going to chemically change the pyruvate. And there's a couple of different ways it can chemically change it. We'll talk about those in a second. But this regenerates the NAD+. Plus a limited resource in the cell. The crappy thing is that you lose the electrical energy. And there's actually a lot more energy in those electrons than there was in the substrate level phosphorylation. But you have no real way to, to use that electrical energy without oxygen. So you're at least getting something. Even if you have to put most of the energy back in, yeah, yeah, yeah. you get a little bit of energy. Any questions over what we've covered thus far? So, where does the electrical energy extracted from glucose end up in... Sorry, I just copied and pasted that. Uh, yeah, that should say in fermentation. My bad, I was working on it at like 1 a.m. Uh, and I apparently forgot to change that. Yes. So that should read, where does the electrical energy extracted from glucose end up in fermentation? Is it on the oxygen? On the NADH? On water? Right. Okay, good. On the ATP? On an organic molecule? Nodding. Raise your hands. Okay, good. The pyruvate, except when you add the electrons to it, it's going to change into something else. There's a couple of different things it can change into, which I believe is actually our next topic. No, sorry. We're going to talk about fermentation in everyday life, and then we'll talk about how that works. Okay. So where do you see fermentation in everyday life? There, fermentation is one of the most common chemical practices uh, on the earth. There's very good evidence that it predates aerobic respiration. <laughs> um, most of the, the, the most primitive uh, and some of the most important uh, microbes on the planet exclusively use fermentation. And we utilize it in all sorts of different processes. So this is the big one. Beer. And wine and mead and anything else that's got alcohol in it, all use a process called alcohol fermentation. This is only one type of fermentation. But in alcohol fermentation, you're breaking down glucose into two pyruvates, redepositing the electrical energy back onto the pyruvates, and this is going to cause the pyruvate to break down into, uh, actually got that a little bit backwards. So the pyruvate is broken down into carbon dioxide and acetaldehyde. 
Then you deposit the electrons on acetaldehyde, and it becomes ethanol. The carbon dioxide goes away, or hangs around in the case of beer. Like in beer, it, it would like to go away, but you kind of cap your beer. And I can actually tell you that most of the carbon dioxide in beer still goes away. Like I've, I've made beer a couple of times, and you, you sit there while it's fermenting, and, it, and you have the big hose attached to it, and it's usually in your bathtub because it's blowing foam all out. You're getting so much carbon dioxide made just from the fermentation that the whole thing is like bubbling constantly, with like little bubbles coming up. And you can actually, if you get even about from like me to you, you can hear it, and it sounds like Rice Krispies. It's pretty awesome. So with beer, you actually only bottle it right at the end. So a little bit of the bubbles get trapped in there. If you tried to bottle beer at the beginning, the pressure would actually build up uh, to the point where uh, um, the glass would explode. We call them bottle bombs. So here we have alcohol fermentation. You've got your pyruvate, energy poor, your NADH, energy rich. You're going to deposit your electrons onto the pyruvate. CO2 leaves, so you're losing a carbon. Pyruvate's a three carbon molecule. Alcohol, or ethanol, is a two carbon molecule. So the alcohol ends up with the electron energy, and the carbon dioxide goes away. <coughs> An important thing to keep in mind about alcohol fermentation is that it is non-reversible. So uh, it's non-reversible because the carbon dioxide leaves. We said all enzymes are reversible, and that's true even of alcohol fermentation, but you have to have the stuff there. And the carbon dioxide goes away. Once the carbon dioxide goes away, you can't reverse it because you don't have all of the stuff that came out. So alcohol fermentation is a permanent fermentative process. There are lots of other types of fermentation uh, done by a whole bunch of different types of bacteria. I'm going to talk about one. Lactic acid fermentation. Lactic acid fermentation is um, not so often used by yeast, but is used by a wide variety of bacteria and is important to us for a lot of reasons, but one is one of my favorite stuff in the world, cheese and yogurt and uh, actually most you know, uh, uh, ferment, well, all fermented dairy products. Um, and quite a lot of, like, uh, lactic acid fermenters are also important in the pickling process and a few other things. They're involved in soy sauce. Um, this can be either good or bad. This is what makes milk into cheese and yogurt. This is also what causes your milk to go sour in the refrigerator, depending upon what organism is doing the making. So bacteria in the milk break down lactose, which is milk sugar, or glucose, which is, you know, normal sugar. Either way, they're going to end up with two pyruvates. Actually, if it's eating the lactose, what it does is it turns the lactose into glucose and then goes on with glycolysis. It's a fairly easy conversion. So you end up with two pyruvates and NADH, actually the two NADHs. Um, instead of removing carbon dioxide, you're going to directly deposit the electrons onto pyruvate. This causes pyruvate to turn into lactic acid, which is what gives cheese and yogurt its sour taste. This is what gives cheese its sharpness, what gives yogurt its tanginess. And it's actually, uh, since it's an acid, it lowers the pH of the milk 
or the, at this point it would be curds and whey, basically. And lowering the pH of the milk with an acid is a big part, it's a, the most important part, of what causes the milk protein, casein, to condense and fall out in the primitive cheese curd form. There are three things that involve that, that cause that casein to fall out. It's the pH, heat, and an enzyme called rennet. You've made cheese, haven't you? Awesome. You should exchange recipes at some point. Um, yeah. And, and uh, of these, the one that was used first and the one that's most important is the acid. You can make cheese with just the acid and a little bit of heat. You can't do it if it's cold, but just a little bit of heat and the acid gives you a very nice cheese. It doesn't have to come from bacteria. I've made cheese just by adding um, lemon juice. And it's a very nice lemon cheese, kind of soft and sweet. Um, or by adding citric acid. That's commonly used for like your bulk processed store cheese. They don't bother using an organism to ferment it. They just, boom, dump the acid right in. It's a modern method. Um, other things, like because the bacteria is in there and it's making lactic acid and that's causing uh, the cheese to come out. It's not just making lactic acid. It's a bacteria that has a complex life. Not as complex as your life, but still a complex life. So it's making other things as well. All of those other things are what goes into making cheese unique and why all of the various different cheeses taste different or it's a part of what goes into that. Um, yeah, so this acid is used in um, production of cheese, the sharpness of yogurt, uh, sour cream, also sauerkraut and kimchi, which are both different types of pickled cabbage. And lactic acid is the fermentative process which is used by you guys. So we've talked about aerobic exercise and that implies that there's also anaerobic exercise. Um, your muscles often need energy faster than you can get oxygen to them. If you're doing something that requires a lot of force right now for a very short amount of time, something like sprinting, uh, lifting a big weight, um, a few other things, I'm not really... Uh, yeah, uh, well, I'm, I'm not really a physicist. I'm also not really a, a like health guy, I guess. Uh, but biochemically, what's going on is when your muscles need energy faster than they can get oxygen there, they have something they can do. They can uh, take your sugar and they can ferment it into lactic acid, just like bacteria and cheese do. Your muscles do lactic acid fermentation. Uh, now, you don't want to pickle your body, so you've got to get rid of that lactic acid somehow. Uh, so the difference here is that the, the cheese, like once it makes the lactic acid, the cheese bacteria has no interest in the lactic acid anymore. It just like lets it go out and alter the pH. You can't have your body's pH change all that much. So all of the acid debt that you build up when you are um, doing lactic acid fermentation in your muscles, that all has to be reclaimed for two reasons. One, you can't leave the acid lying around. And two, like you only got two ATPs out of that thing. There's like 36 to 38 potential ATPs inside of glucose if you do it the right way. And you aren't going to let that food go away. Your ancestors didn't survive by letting nine-tenths of the energy in glucose get out of their hands. They didn't have a McDonald's they could run to right down the road. So you want to get that energy back out. A fortunate thing about lactic acid fermentation is that it's reversible. You're not losing any CO2. So everything's still there. You take your pyruvate, you add your uh, electrons to it, and you get your energy-rich pyruvate, which is your lactic acid. And then, when you've got enough oxygen around, 
you can reverse the process. You can suck the electrons back out and put them back on NADH, run the NADH through the electron transport chain, finish dismantling that pyruvate in the citric acid cycle, and get back on... Uh, uh, get back on to uh, 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 cellular respiration. Anyone have any questions about this? Good. And that clock back there is way off. So I'm going to do a brief time check here. All right, we're good. So question, this one is going to be a little bit more, require a little bit more time. So what would result in the greatest amount of fizz or the least amount of alcohol if, say, you wanted to, to brew like a non-alcoholic but still naturally fizzy and bubbly beer? Okay. Would you use alcohol fermentation? No, right? Because you don't want alcohol in. Okay, what about lactic acid fermentation? But not in your head, what do you think? Possibly. Is it going to give you a fizz? No. It's going to give you a sour beer. What about aerobic respiration? Is it going to give you a fizz? Right. Is it going to give you more or less fizz than alcohol fermentation? Why more? How much more? You're not sure? So if we're doing an alcohol fermentation, every pyruvate yields one carbon dioxide. And there's two pyruvates in the glucose. So you're getting two carbon dioxides and two ethanols per glucose. That's with ethanol fermentation. With aerobic respiration, how many carbons are there in a sugar? Six. How many of them turn into carbon dioxide? Six. Six. So how many carbon dioxides per sugar? Six. Six. So you actually get three times as much carbon dioxide from aerobic respiration than you do alcohol fermentation. Obviously that means that this is the wrong answer. Uh, no, you get, um, uh, I believe that you get six waters as well, because every two electrons lands on an oxygen and turns it into a water. Uh, so it depends on just exactly how much NADH you extract from it. There's actually a couple of different ways that it can go but generally it's figured to be about six waters. <coughs> I think. But I don't need you guys to know the exact numbers. I just need you guys to know more or less. So you're producing more uh, carbon dioxide with aerobic respiration than you are with alcohol fermentation. You're producing more ATP with aerobic respiration than you do with alcohol fermentation. Like, a lot. Any questions? Right. So I'm going to focus in on glycolysis. And glycolysis in like most textbooks is talked about as if it's the only pathway that sugar is digested along. And that's not exactly the case. Standard glycolysis is only one of several pathways that sugar can take inside of the cell. Depending on exactly what it is that you want to do with it. Um, so when you're catabolizing glucose, uh, you split one molecule of glucose into two molecules of pyruvate, capturing two ATP 
and 2NADH in the process. That's your standard classic glycolysis. The two pyruvates are either fermented or run into the citric acid cycle depending upon the type of respiration. No matter what, you always start with glycolysis. But this isn't the only way glucose can be used. There's a couple of other alternate pathways. And these are much more specifically microbial pathways. These are not things that are done commonly by non-microbial organisms. Um, one is that, you know, sometimes when you break down glucose, you want energy, right? In which case, breaking down the glucose into entirely carbon molecules uh, or to waste products like ethanol or lactic acid is fine. But sometimes you need precursor molecules. You actually need to get some, some stuff out of it that you can then rebuild and reuse. So one of these processes is going to deal with that. But let's take a look at glycolysis in detail. Glycolysis has three <coughs> stages where different things are going on. Uh, by the way, I should let you guys know, we always talk about the mitochondria as being the place where glucose is used. Um, it is, but only for the aerobic processes. So like glycolysis doesn't take place in the mitochondria. You can take all the mitochondria out of a cell and it can still do glycolysis. So this happens in eukaryotes, it's in the cytoplasm, it's in prokaryotes, it's also in the cytoplasm. <laughs> The first stage of glycolysis is called the energy investment stage. You actually have to put energy in to get energy out. So that's why I said to net ATP. So you're actually going to have to invest to ATP on the, uh, on the glucose before you can do anything else. One of those ATPs is actually there to trap the glucose in the cell. Because here's the thing. Um, you remember we talked a little bit last week about active versus passive transport um, and how one requires energy and one doesn't? So the molecule that lets glucose across the membrane is actually a passive transport molecule. Glucose can move in and glucose can move out. No problems. It can go either direction. So. Where do you want a higher concentration of glucose? Inside the cell or outside the cell? Inside. So wouldn't the cell just like leak glucose? Yeah. One of those ATPs is there to change the glucose so that it no longer fits through the gate. You slap a phosphate on the glucose, and now it can't get back out. So it's like, let's say we have a door there. People can wander in the room. They can wander out of the room. Um, but like when you wander in the room, there's a guy walking around with like a little like wrist bracelet or something that pads you. Now you can't get out anymore. What's going to happen? Everyone's going to end up inside the room. So you can walk in just on accident. There's no one actually grabbing you and forcing you into the room. So sometimes people wander in, then they can't get out. And that's the way glucose is transported into the cell. Uh, the other phosphate is actually there to prime it for being split. So the second stage is the lysis stage. Lysis means to cut. This is the stage at which the glucose actually splits. Um, it splits into two separate molecules, but then one gets converted directly into the other. So basically, you're going to split it into two three-carbon sugars. The third stage is the energy-conserving stage. This is where you're going to get, you put a little bit of energy in, you prime the pumps, now you're going to get that energy back out. You're in the energy-conserving stage. Uh, this is where you're going to generate your NADHs, so 
So you're taking electrical energy out. You're also going to get four substrate level ATP phosphorylations. So you put two in, you get four out, you got two net. And at the end of this process, uh, you end up with two pyruvic acids. That's your standard run-of-the-mill glycolysis. Now the first alternate that I want to talk about is the pentose phosphate pathway. The pentose phosphate pathway is more commonly used when you need to get building blocks. And this is a very highly branched pathway. Uh, so you can see you're starting with glucose and you're breaking it down into a bunch of different things. This is uh, called the pentose phosphate pathway because it's actually going to go through these five carbon sugars, which is something that glycolysis does. Glycolysis goes from six to three. Pentose phosphate. Pentose means five carbon sugar. It's going to go through these five carbon sugars. You're in the pentose phosphate stage. And uh, those are actually used to synthesize nucleotides. So whenever you need to make more ATP, not from ADP, but you actually need more of the A, like not just phosphorylated, but to build whole new ATPs or whole new GTPs, or whole new whatever the heck sort of thing, um, mostly nucleic acids, that's where you're going to get the sugars to make the nucleotides. Um, there are also a couple of other places where things can branch off here. Um, so these carbons down here can enter into glycolysis if you're an organism that does both. Um, let's see, you can, uh, if you're a photosynthesizing organism, there's a byproduct back there that you can send into photosynthesis. Uh, the long and the short of this is that this is much more efficient at producing um, building blocks, but it's less efficient at producing ATP. So you get two net glucoses from glycolysis. You get one net glucose from the pentose phosphate pathway. So you still get a little bit of energy, but only about half as much. Sorry. You get one, one net ATP from the pentose phosphate, you get two net ATP from glycolysis. The other alternate pathway that I want to talk about is the Entner Dodorov. I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce that. Um, I, I usually pronounce it Entner Dodorov, but uh, Either way. Uh, this is more commonly going to be a pure alternate to glycolysis. So this is more often going to be used uh, by organisms that can't do normal glycolysis. And it has basically the same uh, starting point and ending point. So the, uh, it starts with glucose. You're going to split it into two three-carbon sugars again. Uh, this aldehyde three phosphate. Yeah, so this is going to be, but instead of recombining your two three-carbon sugars, you're going to take them down separate pathways. Uh, but again, you're going to end up with two pyruvates at the end. The big difference is that it uses a slightly different energy 
molecule up there, you're using NADPH instead of NADH. The difference doesn't matter to these guys at this point because biochemistry says one has slightly more or less energy than the other, and I don't recall which. The other big important thing is that you're only going to get, again, two net eight or uh, two total ATP. So you're going to get one net ATP from uh, the entner duodora pathway, and you get two net ATP from glycolysis. So which organism would be best able to make use of a limited energy supply in an anaerobic environment? An organism that does aerobic respiration, very efficient, no oxygen around, so not that one. An organism that does classic glycolysis exclusively. You think so? Raise your hands. Almost everyone. Good. An organism that does pentophosphate pathway exclusively. No, it's going to be making about half as much. Or an organism that does Entner Dudorov exclusively. Again, you're going to be making about half as much. Any questions? One. One net ATP. I don't know enough about the pathway itself to tell you how much of is investment and how much is recuperated. Um, but if you see Entner Duodorov like on a test or something, you should know, oh, that's an, a, an alternative to glycolysis that only gives you one net ATP. So that's who you should know about it. So the last big thing I want to talk to you about today is biosynthetic pathways. So far what we've been talking about is mostly catabolism, uh, breaking things down. We've kind of left out the whole anabolic side of things. And there's a reason for that. Uh, the reason is most organisms, there's only a few catabolic pathways, and they're pretty universal. Like you've got, you know, glycolysis, the citric acid cycle, and <coughs> the electron transport chain. A few different varieties of fermentation. You've got these alternating glycolysis. It's a finite number. Is the point. On the other hand, um, even in a single organism. There could be hundreds of different biosynthetic pathways, of different things, uh, anabolic pathways that you need to make. Because you kind of need a different pathway for each one. So they get really complicated. And then every organism does it slightly differently. So if you memorize it for humans, it isn't necessarily going to be the same as it is for bacteria or yeast, or anything like that. When you go on into biochemistry, you're probably going to, to or if you go on into biochemistry, you're going to probably spend a lot of time memorizing biosynthetic pathways for, um, I'm almost certain that they typically do for a mammalian cell, uh, unless you're uh, particularly in like plant physiology or bacterial uh, I'm not going to make you guys do that because I had to do it once, and to be entirely honest, I've forgotten most of it. Uh, I could look it all up and re-memorize it if I really needed to, but that isn't the focus of this, class, uh, of this class. What I need you guys to understand is the concept of what a biosynthetic pathway is and how it works. The whole idea behind a biosynthetic pathway is that you have a starting point, usually a very simple starting point, and you need to get to a final point, which is the usable molecule. And it's how do you get there? Um, and I, I call this getting from A to B. So all organisms break down chemicals for energy, that's catabolism, and also build new complex molecules to sustain life, that's anabolism. Um, 
the vast majority of organisms out there, in fact, every organism that I can think of, does sort of the obvious bit of anabolism that we will talk about later on, which is how to take your basic building blocks like amino acids or nucleotides or sugar molecules and polymerize them into macromolecules. Like we're going to talk about taking amino acids and making proteins. We're going to talk about, yeah, that clock's not anywhere close. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, taking nucleotides and making DNA. Um, but that's like, you know, if you're a builder uh, and, you know, you're building a house or something like that, uh, and you think, I'm taking raw materials and I'm turning them into the house, right? But the truth is that you're not really taking raw materials. Like, you order bricks, you order, you know, two-by-fours and, uh, and planks and press board, and that's what you're assembling. You didn't make the two by fours. Like wood does grow on trees, but th this life isn't like Minecraft. You can't just walk up to the tree and punch it until planks fall out. So that gives you the question, where do the building blocks come from? Because those building blocks don't just happen by themselves. Uh, big things, well, not, not necessarily big things, but things that eat other things, like us consumers get a lot of our building blocks uh, from the things that we eat. So you've probably heard about the essential amino acids, right? Those are the ones that you can't make yourself. And actually, those are the ones that you mostly make the ones that you can make out of. <coughs> Microbes are much more likely to not be able to just get whatever they need from the environment because they're not going around eating entire organisms. They are uh, forced to kind of take the most simple stuff. It's 10 o'clock, by the way, so we've got 20 minutes left. Because I see some people. What? 15. Sorry. 10, 15. We've got 15 minutes left. Um, where was I? Oh, yes. Uh, so they're much more likely to be the ones that have to actually make the building blocks themselves, which means that they're going to start with very um, simple things that are found in the environment. Uh, and they're going to combine a bunch of those together to get the slightly more complex but still fairly simple building blocks of amino acids and nucleotides and stuff like that. So um, if A is common in the environment, like maybe it's carbon dioxide, or it could be ammonia, some simple inorganic or very simple organic molecule, you take in all of your A's, and then it would be awesome if you just had an enzyme, like it was an A to B convertase, that just starts with A, whatever it is that's common, and it goes, boom. I add energy and boom, it becomes B. Doesn't actually work like that. Enzymes are totally awesome, but they are limited in what they can do. They are not actually like little nano robots, much as I wish that they were. Um, most enzymes can only do one, or at best, like two or three chemical reactions. And those chemical reactions have to be fairly, not simple, but short steps energetically. So to get from A to B requires a lot of steps in between. So let's say, oops, that was supposed to come in later. Um, so let's say that you start off with A, okay? And we're going to have an enzyme that comes into A, and it's going to take a little bit of a nick at the top, and a little bit of a nick there, and then cleave that little part off. So this is going to be a, maybe a hydrolase or a something else. It's going to take a little bit off that A. That's one step. 
You might have another enzyme. This one would be called an isomerase. It's not cutting anything off or attaching anything. You see it changed the shape a little bit there. This comes in, it kind of cleats it up. All right, now we've got a third enzyme. This is going to be a synthase, and it's going to attach two little pieces here and zip away. We're going to have our last enzyme come in and attach the most complicated fiddly bits, which were actually kind of very difficult to do in PowerPoint, and attach them on. And it flies away. And now you've gone from A to B. And there's a few interesting things to keep in mind with regards to biosynthetic pathways. First off, uh, this is a linear pathway, but they don't have to be linear. Okay? Some of them are cyclical, like the, the, the citric acid cycle is cyclical. Uh, s most of them are branched. Either you're going to have a lot of stuff coming in on the left, or you're going to have a lot of stuff going out on the right. So just to, um, you know, I'll show you an example of that in a second. The third thing to keep in mind is that your body and, and even the basic microbial cells try to be as efficient as possible. If you can get two or three things out of one biosynthetic pathway, that's awesome. So you'll notice that on our path from A to B, what did we go through? E. So if we need E, we don't have to go all the way to B. We can just grab twice as much A, and like half of the E will just siphon off and use for E. Each step has a separate enzyme. And intermediate products can often be useful by themselves. And sometimes at those intermediate project, uh, uh, products, you get branch points where you might go off to produce a different thing. Well, E here has two possibilities. You could turn E into B, or you could turn E into F, depending upon what you need. We're going to talk uh, later on about genetics and about nutrition. Now, there's a couple of things here I want you to keep in your mind. Each of these steps is going to be done by a single enzyme. For the most part, one gene equals one enzyme, or at least one enzyme equals one gene. Genes can do lots of stuff that isn't enzymes, but at least in bacteria, for the most part, an enzyme comes from a gene. What if we were to break some of those genes? Let's say that we break this gene here. Are we going to be able to make E? No. Are we going to be able to make F? What about B? No. So you're going to have a bacteria that can't make E, F, or B. What if we break this gene? Can it make E? Yeah. Can it make F? Can it make B? No. This is actually a lot of how we determine the, the order. It would be awesome if bacteria could just tell you what order they did stuff in, um, but they don't. So we have to go through and we break each gene in sequence, and we can go, okay, like if we break this gene, then we get E and F but not B. So that means that E or F has to be made before B. If we break this gene, we don't get F. If we make, break this gene, we don't get B. That means that um, both of those uh, uh, enzymes happen after the pathway splits. And usually the way we do this is you take a bacteria like E. coli. E. coli doesn't need anything in particular, right? It needs energy and a few salts. And if you give it glucose and a few salts, it can make everything else on its own. Everything that it needs, it can make from, uh, you know, given the energy and glucose. And it can't make salts because salts aren't organic. There's just no way to make them. You have to pick them up from the environment. Um, and then you're just going to take a, a big mutation gun. 
aim it at your E. coli and you blast it and you try to just randomly kill genes. And you know, the genes that you can see are the ones that make it so that the bacteria don't grow. So you're going to blast your E. coli and then you're going to grow it on what's called rich media. That's media that contains everything. It's got, it's got media with A, B, C, D, E, F, and G, all of the alphabet soup in there. And they're all going to live. I mean, except the ones that are just like something absolutely essential to the cell got broken. Those die. You never see those. They all grow in the rich media. And then you take each of them and you say, okay, now I'm going to see what grows on the rich media, but what doesn't grow on media that's rich except it doesn't have A. You go, oh, this grew on the rich media, but it doesn't grow on a less media. That means it has something broken in its A biosynthetic pathway. And you go, ah, well, this one can grow on rich media, but it can't grow on A or B less media. So you go, okay, so this is missing a gene that's involved in both A or B. Hope to God that they only got one gene missed. Because if like, you just happen to mutate one gene in the A pathway and one gene in the B pathway, it completely screw you up. You would normally assume that that means that this, the A and B are in the same pathway and that this was back here. Then you have to approve that. That's the way we found out about all this stuff uh, in the days before we could just take our little microbe, pop it in the sequencer, and ching, I have all of your, you know, stuff just come out. Although even today that gives you the information, but it doesn't tell you what it does. You can have all of the genomic information that you want in the world, and you go, this is the entire genome of E. coli. And you go, oh, that's great. What's it do? I don't know. That's actually the really hard part. Okay, we got any questions before we're done for the day? All right. Uh, in that case, we're like five minutes early. That's a good compensation for being five minutes late last Thursday. So.